Hello and welcome in. This is Expanding the Zone. Uh, welcome, however you may be listening, uh, be it podcast app, uh, uh, iHeart, uh, Spotify, Apple, uh, again, wherever you get your podcasts, we're out there. Or if you're watching us on uh, YouTube, SBC Sports Zone Shane, appreciate that as well. well here we are. Uh, we've reached our 10th show, and we think we have another fun topic for you tonight. Uh, if you're new to the show, we basically take what's relevant in, in sports today, and we try to tie it into high school sports. We try to tie it into coaching and the leadership. So if you're into any of those things or or, or just in, 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 you know, enjoy you know, sports topics and or if you're involved in leadership of any kind, I think this shows something you're definitely going to enjoy. I uh, continue to appreciate the feedback. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's been coming consistently throughout, and I uh, can't thank you enough for that. Uh, throughout our first nine shows, we've covered a little bit of everything, COVID-19, Astros cheating, the last dance took us through two or three different topics, and um, you know, I, I think we've got a good one uh, here again tonight. So I'm Shane Coles. My brother Matt's here with me. And, you know, Matt, as I welcome you to the show, I know show number 10 tonight has something to do with officials and, and, and umpires and so forth. I'm going to kind of give you the lead role here this evening. And uh, first thing is I throw it to you, uh, welcome. And uh, do you have any fancy title for us here tonight? Kind of tell us a little bit about the, uh, the topic, uh, how we arrived here tonight, and uh, you know, maybe get us started. Yeah, I think that uh, there's really no fancy title for this. I, I think, honestly, it's just a show about uh, whether or not we have a shortage of officials. I think that's been a big topic. Um, and if we do, do we have them in all sports? Which sports do we have official shortages in? Um, why? And really, hopefully, like we do in all of our shows, try to come up with some solutions, right, to the problem. And, uh, um, you know, we had a couple emails about, about this topic in terms of, you know, we've had emails from different angles in terms of quality of officiating and, and, and are there, uh, is there a shortage of officials in general? Is there a shortage of quality officials, both, you know, all these things. Um, and it really got us thinking because you see on social media quite a bit. I mean, if you really pay attention on social media, you constantly see things about, uh, shortage of officials, right? Like officials are getting out of the game for this reason or that reason, usually it's, it's, it's blamed on uh, fan behavior or whatever. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but, but basically there's this, this, there's this overwhelming uh, opinion out there. It seems like that we have a shortage of officials and I wanted to dig into it a little bit further because to be honest with you, as an athletic director, Shane, I haven't really seen it a lot, um, especially in like your major sports, like football and basketball, it seems to me like, you know, in our area, at least, I don't know whether we just haven't been hit by this or I haven't noticed it or whatever. Now, I'll admit, we utilize an assigner at our school now. So I, after after hiring officials myself for several years, now we leave that up mo in most sports to an assigner, especially in football and basketball. Is the assigner max 7 through 12, or is that just a varsity level? It, it is for us now, yeah, 7 through 12. Um hmm. And in talking to our signer, I know he has some real concerns in some sports about the numbers. It seemed to me like in basketball and football, we didn't see as much of this because I know in football, um, they're encouraging us now at the high school level to, to, to have six officials in some games. You know, we have three officials in JV basketball, freshman basketball, three man crews and at every level seems like. So, you know, I got to thinking, well, do we really have a shortage of officials if we're, if we're adding a sixth in football, if we're doing, you know, but, but I think as I dug into this a little bit, as we're going to talk about tonight, it's, it's a shortage in a lot of the other sports, some of these quote unquote secondary sports uh, and, and, a fear for a shortage in the future due to like the age of officials and things like that. So we're, you know, we're going to dig into some of these topics really. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I think it's interesting, the hiring of it. You know, I've been there with the, the junior high athletic director and, and, um, and, you know, being a coach myself and, and, you know, as a fan and as a media member and so forth. And I think, you know, I am with the word perspective. I think throughout tonight, it'll be really interesting for me to take a look at the different perspectives of, of people involved i guess when you look at your notes there where where do you want to start this week well i think i think one as as we look at the, this this topic of is there a shortage um, I, I tried to reach out to some some officials that i know 
some guys I have a lot of respect for. Um, the officials I've tried to reach out to and talk to are ones that have officiated multiple sports, ones that are involved within their chapters, you know, mm. and within their, within their officiating chapters, um, uh, involved, you know, they, they, they try to get involved their district level, you know, with their officiating, uh, trap chapters and all that so because i really wanted a perspective and then i and then i tried to talk to a couple guys who just officiate uh, just trying to get some opinions on 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 several of these areas but the one thing that jumped out at me as i talked to one particular guy who's who's very involved within his chapter of, is the concern of not enough officials younger officials getting into the game so that we have guys as some of the older guys retire eventually and get out. So, so there's a concern about that. And then we, we are seeing shortages in some sports. For instance, we're seeing shortages in our area, at least in volleyball and soccer um, and track and cross country. And it's interesting to me because those are some sports I think where probably not a lot of people grow up around them to the extent they do maybe, maybe football, basketball or whatever. So you wonder, is that part of the reason why you have a shortage? Because those are some sports, quite frankly, that, you know, financially you can make some money at probably in a little bit of a lower stress environment than that of a basketball official or a football official. You know, let's face it, if you're a track official, you're not seeing a lot of controversy. You're not getting yelled at by a whole lot of fans and coaches, right? Volleyball is a sport that, again, you're not breaking up fights between players. You know, they're on their side of the net, you know, physically, because that's the other thing I heard was uh, physically in some of these sports, as officials get older, if they have any sort of injuries, any th type of thing, all of a sudden now you can't run up and down the basketball court and keep up with these kids. But in volleyball and track and some of these sports, you know, you can do those things even if you have a physical problem. So it was surprising to me, but 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 it's a fact. Um, soccer, I guess, is one of the worst in our areas. Um, and, and oddly enough, the there's a lot of uh, soccer officials out there for like club and elite and, and off season soccer or whatever, but not so much at the, at the Ohio high school levels. So, uh, so that's what I'm finding out is some of these, some of these secondary sports. I mean, you coach baseball, Shane, um, and that was one of the sports that came up uh, how, how so many more people right now uh, want to do softball rather than baseball, right? Because it's a quicker game. It's quote unquote, easier money, whatever that means, you know, but yet when I, I know I brought up last year, should we pay more for soft for baseball than softball? And people were like, I don't know if you can do that because of title nine. And that. But I'm th hmm. I, to me, it's quite simple. You know, one guy's working two and a half hour and one guy's working an hour and 20 minutes. I mean, you know, to me, don't you pay more for the sport that takes longer so but anyway i know i know i'm throwing a lot at you right now but basically that that that's some of the things i came up with in terms of when i started asking the question do we actually have a short a shortage of officials i know both of us received some really valuable um you know responses when we reached out to some people and and as you were talking about some different things i was taking a couple notes here i wanted to unwrap this about three different ways if that's okay um pressure effort and time are, are the things i thought that, that really stood out to me let's take those one at a time if you don't care first of all with the um pressure so to speak i, I think what i mean by pressure is you know <laughs> obviously when you're officiating you're always under a microscope, but really in today's society, especially uh, no matter what the level is, you know, the pressure to, to, to make certain calls and so forth. But here, here's what I find interesting about some of the sports you name. What I found with a lot of people, and this is probably more so with the men, okay, is, is, is I've been growing up and, and had a lot of friends become parents. And, and then a lot of parents, you know, um, have, have young ladies get into volleyball and so forth. Not as many people throughout your community know the sport of volleyball, maybe as detailed as they do some of the other sports. Um, yeah, I, I kind of joke, and, and I and I joke. I it's almost I laugh to keep from crying. You know, when it comes to some of the toughest calls on the volleyball court, we we bring people out of the stands to make those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, say it's one of those things that, you know, in all seriousness, the the 
the pressure and some of those different things, um, you know, put you in a little bit more of, of, of a situation. Uh, you, you started mentioning baseball, softball. I want to look at that in about three different ways. Right now, I just want to look at it from the pressure standpoint. What I mean by pressure, again, is, is having those difficult things that are going to really lead to the criticism from fans, from coaches, from so forth. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, for two and a half hours, if I'm back there calling balls and strikes, there's a little bit more pressure than when I, you know, umpire the bases. That's not to say I don't have bang bang plays on the bases, but obviously balls and strikes, I don't have an opportunity mentally to relax from start to finish. So these are some of the things I'm hearing. And so I do, I think it's, I think it's interesting from sport to sport, just from the difficulty standpoint to, to, to go. The second thing I wanted to look at was the effort. I would also say in volleyball, again, it doesn't mean there's not difficult things. Your mind has to really go. You really have to pay attention. Are they running 6-2? Are they running 5-1? Are there back row attacks? A lot of different things. And again, I start saying a lot of those things, and we have a lot of listeners out there, I guarantee you, like, I don't even know what the heck he's talking about. Because again, that's kind of what happens in the well, that was That was my point where, you know, you don't grow up around it, maybe. If you yes. Don't I, you, don't, I you, don't, that... you don't watch it on TV, right? I mean, you grow up, even if you don't play football or basketball, you're watching it or whatever. I agree. So now on the effort standpoint, this is an interesting thing to me. If you're, if you are working soccer, if you're working basketball, there's a physical command. I, I know I reached a certain age where I just simply could no longer play open gym because I didn't feel like for an hour and a half, two hours, I could go up and down. I certainly couldn't do it five days a week. You know what I'm saying? So right, like, right. It, I think, I think when I look at the effort of of soccer and basketball and so forth. You know, football's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, I think volleyball, baseball, softball, it's a different type of fatigue. You know, when you're, when, you know, I know you're not running and doing some of those things, but you are, you know, you are on your feet and so forth. You start, you start working four, five, six softball, baseball games a week. That, that wears on you. So I think, I think effort's something. And then obviously you mentioned the time. I, I know there's, a, there's an ongoing joke in baseball about how, you, man, you really have to have a Monday or Friday game because, you know, some of the number ones are going to be on the mound in baseball and, you know, they're going to throw strikes and they're going to do this. Where in softball, let's face it, your top pitcher is out there every night. She's usually around the zone. You get two pretty good pitchers. Uh, you know, I, throughout my 20-year career, about it, it, it's crazy how many third innings I've looked over in the stands and, and the two softball teams are like eating their hot dog and drinking their pop waiting for the baseball right. game then to get on right. the bus, right? right. So it's, it's one of those things that, that there there's some certain truth to that. So again, the three things, I don't know which one you think outweighs the other, if it's a mixture, but I, I, I again, in my notes there, I looked at, you know, pressure, um, tough calls, difficulty. I looked at effort. Uh, and then I looked at the time that, that's put in, and I think all three of those things, along with some of the personal issues I know we'll get into, uh, probably is at least the start of this conversation. D is there anything that, you know, comes to your mind? Th those are the three things that I kind of summed up from what you were saying. Yeah, I, I, I think we're going to talk about all three of those for sure. I think that where I started with this, Shane, when 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 we started looking into this was, this idea that because this 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 has always sort of bothered me a little bit. There's this this idea um, that officials are either getting out of the sport or getting out of the business, so to speak, of officiating because fans yell at them, basically, or the fan behavior is is out of control. And 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 the reason that's always bothered me is one. It's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine in, in life in general and in sports or whatever, where when we take a really complex issue and we just we just paint it with this broad brush and try to make it as simple as possible. You know, I think this whole thing about officiating and why people don't do it or why people get out of it is a complex issue. I think we're going to talk about a few things here tonight, okay? And to just sit here and say, oh, well, I'll tell you why people aren't officiating. The fans are terrible. The fans, yeah, or whatever. I, one, I think, to me, it's a little bit of a slap in the face of officials because it almost it almost suggests that officials get into officiating with the idea that fans aren't going to yell at them, and then all of a sudden they're shocked by this. Oh, wait a minute. I did a game the other night, and some fans yelled at me. This is terrible. These guys aren't that naive. These are smart guys, man. They grew up around sports. They understand yeah. since the beginning of time this is – 
things happen. You know, fans are going to yell sometimes. Yeah, like you know, like they were they were waiting for the crowd to say, "Oh, great call! You well, made a great that's judgment what I mean. there." <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Right. These guys, right. it's a slap in their face to suggest that they're that naive. They're not naive about that. They understand that. Um, it's just like with coaches. If if I had a coach tell me two years after they started coaching, "Hey, I quit because parents didn't agree with me." And some people in the stands were second guessing me. I would wow. tell them, I was like, what rock were you living under before you started coaching? You know, why, why'd you even start if you honestly thought that wasn't going to happen? So I think sometimes we like to, you know, the OHSA especially wants to come out with all this stuff about fan behavior. And that's legitimate. Don't get me wrong. We're going to talk a little bit about game management and some sure. issues. And, but, but, but to sit here and act like that's the number one reason why people weren't officiating or that's the overwhelming reason to me that's 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 naive that, that, that's not the case in fact as i talked to some people uh you know that they, they said look these guys that have been doing this 25 30 years obviously they're not letting this stuff affect them to that extent or they'd have got out a long time ago if that was the reason mm. uh, does it affect is it stopping some younger people maybe but i'm just i'm going to be real honest with you if that stops you from becoming an official, you probably weren't cut out to be one. I mean, I'm just going to just be straight with you, okay? Because right. these things, you know, since the beginning of time, you've had the, this dynamic, and and that's never going to change completely. Now, has, has it gotten out of control at times? Yeah, you read these horror stories, right, of officials getting attacked at a game physically or, you know, this this nonsense. I mean – I'm not talking about those things. Those people ought to be prosecuted to the fullest extent Absolutely, of the law. Right. I mean, that is I follow you. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I follow. But, but the that is. There. But yeah. we got to stay away from extremes here, right? I mean, that's an extreme. That's not something that's happening on a daily basis. What is happening on a daily basis, though, uh, more and more, is there. There are some crowd control issues. There are things that need to be addressed. We're going to talk about them here here in a bit. But, but like I said, the one thing as I got into this. Uh, I found out very, very quickly is the shortage of officials is not due strictly <laughs> to fan behavior or officials getting yelled at. That's, that's just not the case. It's a, and so like you say, in those sports that have the pressure calls, right, every sport has them from time to time, but the sports where you're probably – I've always felt like basketball is one of the toughest sports to officiate just simply because the crowd's right on top of you. It's a fast moving game. There's bang, bang calls all the time. There's not a lot of time to think in between calls. You have the physical, you, you use the word effort. I would almost, I think what you're trying to say there is basically physical capabilities to an extent, right? The, well, the, physical, F, the, the physical effort it takes, it takes work right. for an hour and a half, two hours, two basketball and a half Basketball is one of the highest And then, and then when that. you consider basketball, are you working Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or, sure. or or some of these people get involved in the junior high? So I know in our area they they may go, they may go literally every night, uh, you know, right. Saturday, they, Sunday. You know, a lot of your junior high officials now we, we've talked about in our little league show. You know, it's there's a lot more levels there they get involved and so forth. So I, I guess when I said effort, I was talking about just the physical. Well, that, no, exactly. That's what that's the, what I knew you were getting on, on the body. And I think, so, you know, you take a sport like basketball that fits into that too. That's why I think there are a sport like that's very difficult to do. I think football um, is, it can be difficult, but you're a little further away from the crowd. You don't have the, maybe the people all over you. You can't hear what the crowd plays, saying. It plays a big role there, Matt, because I think yeah. in, in a gym with volleyball and basketball, again, people are right there on top of you. Um, a lot of the lower levels where you have a lot of these problems, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, it's you can hear everything that's being said. Where, where where I notice in a football game, there's there's crazy things being said all the time, but no one hears it. You know what I mean? Like it's right. so difficult to hear it all the way down on field level. Um, I, I think even conversations between players and officials, coaches and officials, I hear people say all the time that. You know, you, you'll let a little bit more go or you'll have more open dialogue because, again, you don't feel like, quote, unquote, it's it's drawing attention or being you know, showing up of any type. Um, so I, I think I think atmosphere certainly certainly plays a role. I think those are those are all fair points in terms of pressure or whatever word you want to use, you know, in terms right. of, of, of things. Let me let me ask you this real quick. You know how big I am on perspective when it comes to leadership. I just. 
I was just curious to see what you were, you were thinking in terms of, cause you're an AD, you're a coach. I've been an AD coach, multiple sports. We've been doing this for a long, long time. What role do you think relationships play here before we actually get into the officiating and, and umpiring and so forth in terms of, you know, the official and you as an AD, uh, the official and you as a coach on the sideline on a, on a Friday night. And then just, you know, through, throughout you guys working in, in those aspects over the course of a 10, 15, 20 year career, what, what, what role does relationships play in this, if any? I mean, I think some, I, I know, you know, as we, you know, as we get into this tonight, especially as we try to come up with some solutions to some of these issues, mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk a little bit about some things coaches can do. And I think, because I think we're going to try to, what we're going to try to do is talk about what each party in this can do to help. Right. right. And so <clears throat> when you start talking about what coaches can do, uh, do I think the relationship factor i guess can, can play a role I, I guess where i feel like where i question though how big a role that plays is, again is it goes back a little bit to what i was talking about before where this dynamic has been here forever right there has been a dynamic since the beginning of high school sports of coach official where there's going to be disagreements right they don't always see eye to eye right i mean uh, you watch Hoosiers, right, back in the day, you know, the, the official and, and Coach Dale, you know, they had their differences. But, no, I mean, forever you've had that. Now, I would like to think there's <laughs> – Sorry, you may be thinking of, like, Shooter coming on against Tariq. <laughs> You're out of position to make the well, I mean, yeah, See, yeah. whoever was at uh, – I think it was a road game, I was going to say, uh, but the Hickory administration and, and, and the road right. – They needed to do a better job of game management. We're going to talk about that. But, uh, but no, I, I think that I, – I think that – there's always been this dynamic there. And look, we haven't had an official shortage in the past. So I guess what I'm saying is if, if, if that relationship was a major thing, why didn't we have official shortages in the 60s and 70s or 80s? So, I mean, do I think it matters? Yeah. Do I think it's a, a huge factor? I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't. It'd be an interesting thing to ask an official for sure. Well, it's certainly interesting. I guess where I was coming from a little bit is, you know, we talked about perspective so much last week when we thought about a parent-coach relationship and so forth. And when I when I think of this, and I'm just trying to be very honest here, very straightforward. When I when I was an athletic director, a good official was one that never canceled, that always showed up, or right. always the, when I when I'm coaching, you know, what I mean, it gets into a little bit more of the heat of the battle, the different things, and the communication, the way we talk to each other, and so forth. And you know, there's always that understanding of you know, when, when you have professionals involved, you know, you know, the official, the official will understand a lot of times that they're there that night, they're, they're officiating team A and team B and, you know, they, they don't care who wins or I, I truly believe that, you know what I mean, in terms of their, you know, when they're doing it the right way, whereas obviously as coaches, we're, we're going to hang on every outcome and, and every result. And I guess that's where, when you started talking about the assigner earlier, that that was interesting to me in terms of do you, do you feel like it's becoming more and more difficult for people to a find games b find games in the right spots um, the right levels because I you know I think most most officials will tell you there's certain places they're not comfortable you know maybe they graduated from there maybe they right. you know maybe they teach there maybe their kid goes to school there maybe. Maybe they're friends, maybe they're really good friends with the coach. You know what I'm saying? It's one of right. those things where, hey, I'm not going to do, you know, Shane Combs' game because he and I are, are, are good friends or, or whatever. That, that's why I thought the personal relationship was an interesting dynamic here in terms of, you know, I hear, I hear a lot of people saying it's, it's, it's you know, coming, becoming difficult sometimes uh, to, to get the – the certain games that I want to get or to get opportunities to, to move into the varsity boys game or, you know, I hear, I'll hear baseball umpires stop me all the time. Hey, I, you know, I'm not at your place this year. I, I, I really wanted to you see you guys once or, you know, it's, and it's kind of hurt me in the postseason. That comes up a lot. Right. Which, so that, that's what I mean by relationships too. Um, I think, I think we're in two different dynamics here a little bit. They're interesting. One, I do think that the, that the relationship between the athletic director and the official has has taken a step back probably but just because 
it used to be, you know, as an AD, you had to get on the phone and you had to call somebody right. and you had to say, Hey, would you like to work a game over here? And during those conversations, sometimes you kind of got to know a guy a little bit, or, you know, you talked a little bit about this or that or whatever. And then the guy shows up to your gym and you, you know, you, you show them to their dressing room, you talk some more, whatever. Where now all of a sudden, you know, a lot of this is being done by an assigner, which I, I gotta be honest with you. I like, not just because as an athletic director, it takes some pressure off me in terms of filling these games, but I think there's some real positives to to having an assigner from a from a from a school standpoint, which is it gets rid of some of that controversy that used to surround games or man, they hire this guy four times a year to, to work at such and such school and we never get a fair shake over there. Right, right, right. or wrong, there was that perception, right? Yeah. That the that the whole assigner thing has sort of helped and taken care of. Um so, and, and obviously, as an AD, it's it's that peace of mind, especially in sports like baseball, softball, where I know we have a rain out. We're going to make up a game the next day. I don't have I get to get that. on the phone. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, at I times, it. I can remember making 30, 40 phone calls. I'm not kidding you. Trying no, to find I get, I've JV, been there, yeah. Trying to find JV softball umpires for a makeup game a few years back and not being able to find one. You mentioned line judges earlier, which, again – you know, the, the the shortage of volleyball officials baffles me a little bit. But, like, I, I we had a tournament game last year, and I made – I'm not kidding you now. I made 42 phone calls, okay? Or I, I reached out to 42 officials, let me put it that way, about do, just line judging a tournament game. I mean, hey, I'm going to pay you 60 bucks, man, to come over here and line judge this tournament game. Couldn't find them. Couldn't find them. Eventually had to find – Luckily, somebody I knew had a connection in club volleyball and found a couple club volleyball coaches that understood the game that had no affiliation with either school. And I was like, hey, bring them in, right? Because I didn't – I mean, here we are. We're hosting a sectional championship game. I don't want mom and dad coaching or, or reffing the lines. You know what I mean? Right. Can you imagine a game-deciding call to go to a to, – to win a sectional championship made by – Someone's parent. I mean, I you know, I, I, and I know. I see it two nights a week <laughs> in the fall. I, mean, I know, and but anyway, so I think. But I, back to the original point, I got off topic here a little bit. But I think the assigner has uh, affected that relationship a little bit between AD and official. Now, that takes me to one of the reasons. One of the things that came up is how officials interact with other officials. All right. I don't know if you want to go as far to say how they treat each other or whatever, but that interaction, because I'll have officials come up to me and say what you just said a minute ago. I'm not getting a game at your play. And there's some people that claim, well, if, if this assigner doesn't like me, I don't get a game. He's got his. Yeah, where before I was working with 25 different ADs. Now I'm working right. with one person. Right. Yeah. And if this guy doesn't like me, I don't get games or I don't get the best games or I hear this one all the time, you know, you know, these assigners, they have their favorite crews or um, they have their groups that they take care of first and I'm left out in the cold. Um, so that that's an interesting dynamic, too, of how officials treat each other. I even had a guy tell me, you know, back in the day, um, just talking about do older officials sort of tutor or mentor younger officials and how back in the day, uh, and I didn't know this because I haven't officiated other than a little bit of baseball while I was in college, but <clears throat> these guys used to ride the game together. Like the JV and varsity officials would ride to a basketball game together a lot of times. And the varsity guys would watch the JV guys work, give them pointers. Then the JV guys would stay around and watch the varsity guys work and learn right? I mean, what valuable learning. Where now, these guys don't even know each other. They're getting hired by an assigner. The assigner um, sends a freshman JV crew to the game. They get done. They go home, right? They don't hang around. They get their check and leave. They don't watch the varsity game where they could be learning valuable lessons. But, you know, hey, like you said, maybe they work four or five nights a week, right? They, they, they got families. They don't want to hang around. I get it. They leave. So now, you know, some of that mentorship is lost and Shane you know as well as I do just from coaching have you ever had any more valuable learning in coaching than what you've learned from older coaches during them mentoring you either you being their assistant or you just sitting down and talking with guys I mean am I right to think that's the best learning experience a guy can have and I think from what I'm finding out from officials 
they're missing out on that. There's, there is not a lot of that going on right now where older officials are taking younger officials under their wing and really teaching them the game. And I'm not really blaming the older officials. I'm just saying whatever the dynamic is, maybe it's time, maybe it's logistics, whatever, it's not happening. Well, what's interesting about that point to me is I think in teaching, you know, when I first started in my career, you know, we, we really – we're really trying to dive in, know the whole, the whole child, you know, get to, get to know them, what, what makes them click all these different things. And then we've kind of moved into this testing age of where if you're not careful, you almost, you almost look at the a kid as a statistic or a number where, where now I'm slowly starting to see it here in, in the, in the back end of the career, kind of going back the same way. And some of those relationships, the signer AD, all those different things, that's kind of what was coming to my mind. Matt, let me flip it on you a little bit and, and ask you about, becoming an official to begin with like I know in coaching for example okay I understand in today's time certain levels of coaches particularly your head coaches are going to have to be certified in different things and so forth but some of these some of these people even just trying to get into some volunteer work or, or, or some of these different things I know there's, there's a lot of different things that go through it can be financially stressful it can be a lot of things don't you think there's something to be said in terms of the difficulty and, and some of the upfront costs in terms of becoming an, an official as, as well, in terms of these younger people, maybe, you know, you know, maybe maybe they're looking at it as, um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna do some junior high level and we'll do some JV and that's all I want to do or advance, uh, but 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 just to become even to that level up front, there there's some cost involved and I don't think a lot of people understand just how difficult it is to get started. There is and. I know, again, just from sort of doing some research for this show, um, you know, when we talk about solutions later, I was going to mention this, but I'm going to mention it now. Um, one of the things that, like, officials and, and, like, the Ohio High School Athletic Association and officials are going to have to do, and I think they're starting to try to address some of these things, is figure out a way to make make it more attractive and make it easier for people to become officials in the sense that how they can educate, like in other words, how they take the classes to become licensed, how much it costs to get licensed and to get the equipment. Because I think what you got to be careful of, you're not just going to let whoever become an official and not learn how to do it. So there has to be a class. There has to be some education. Sure. Okay. But how can they make that education more feasible in terms of, I know like one of the things they're doing are having classes actually at the high school level where they're offering officiating classes in high school. Um, I had a number given to me that 200 schools, which I thought was crazy. I didn't realize it was that many are offering officiating classes at that level. And these classes are pretty popular, but, but what's happening is a lot of these people aren't following through actually getting their license and going on to officiate. And the thought is maybe one of the reasons is the cost. I mean, think about it. If you're, if you take a class and all of a sudden, let's say you're a college kid, you're on a limited budget, you're wanting to work some games at the junior high level or whatever to get some experience and to make a few bucks. Right. But all of a sudden you got to dish out, uh, in a sport like baseball, I heard as much as $800 possibly in equipment uh, for, for gear, for, for uniform, for licensure, whatever. These kids that age, they don't all have that type of money. I mean, you might have to work, you know, a whole year's worth of games to make up for the initial investment. Just to pay so, that off, yeah. Right. So, so is there a way they can make licensure cheaper? Is there a way they can make equipment or getting their hands on equipment cheaper? Um you know, these are some of the things I think as we talk about solutions at the highest levels, at the Ohio high school level and at the, or, and, and in whatever state for that matter, at the state level and the officiating chapters, can they get creative uh, to make it more attractive and easier to get involved in? Well, it, it, it is, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because think about it here. If you're, if you're somewhere in that age of, 18 to, to 24 and you're finishing up high school and you're going through college and you're going through th different situations, you know, obviously financially is tough. Uh, when it comes to travel, though, it's a little bit difficult because depending on where you live, you know, you, 
I, I think it's a good idea. I don't know where you stand on this. I think it's a pretty good idea to try to avoid your homeschool and, and, and some of the things you have association with. So that's going to involve a little bit more travel. Um, that, that, that's a difficult well, dynamic. So before you know right. it, you might have hour, hour and a half of driving involved in a lot of different things that after a while, like you said, um, as these people start to get older, get into the family situation, a, a lot of the dynamics just don't work out. Well, and, and, and that brings me to my next my next thing. Another reason that I was told is is the financial part. Let's let's just talk about pay a little bit, right? What are officials getting in terms of pay? Because what we're ta we're talking finances here, right? I mean, we were talking financial part of the initial investment of getting in officiating, but now let's talk a little bit about what you get paid. This has always been an interesting topic because let's face it, no matter who you are, if you are in a line of work, you are always bar. You are always asking for a little more pay. That's natural. I get it. You know, mm -hmm. everybody wants to be paid a little bit more, no matter what they're doing, right? Um, so this has been a topic that's come up a lot over the last few years. Uh, hey, have you thought about increasing pay in this area? Um, of course, you've got schools that are on limited budgets, right? We're trying to figure out, okay, how can how can we finance our entire athletic department here? We, can't just you know we, we can't just go crazy and pay this amount we've got to think about our entire budget you know so you have this dynamic of schools wanting to save some money officials wanting to be paid a little bit more I get it I got I got to looking at this a couple of years ago for our own pay and, and and just looking at league averages and and because we you know basically there's a market right it's like anything else the market is set um, you know at, at my school we pay based on what, every, what, what the average is or what we're paying across the board. You're always going to have a school that pays a little more and a school that pays a little less, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a market. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the free agent market in baseball, right? There's a market, right. uh, you know, when Prince Fielder got overpaid and Albert Pujols got overpaid, guess what my favorite team did? They had to pay for Joey Votto, you know? I mean, that was right. just the way it was going to go. There's a market for this and, depending on who you, you ask, officials may be underpaid. I think some people believe that, some people don't. I look at it this way, you know, like you take a sport in our area, like football and basketball, uh, what I found when I did my research uh, in terms of what we were going to pay people was, was that for varsity officials, it was about $70 was the average. It was actually uh, just a hair under that, like 68 so, so for instance, the school I'm at decided we were going to pay seventy dollars for football, for basketball, for baseball. Um, so you know, you look at that and you start breaking that down to an hourly wage. I, I think that it's you know, when you consider that for a varsity basketball game, someone's someone's arriving at the gym somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, good officials aren't going to get there you know last minute. They're going to show up professionally, get there, maybe start of the JV game, whatever. Uh, so that you know, you're talking six o'clock to nine thirty before they get out of there. So three and a half hours or so. Um, three to three and a half hours. So, you know, what that is, I think football probably a hair more than that. It seems like football officials kind of get there maybe a little bit earlier just to take care of some things. You know, so they're probably there maybe maybe four, four and a half sometimes, depending. But, like, so you're talking anywhere between $17, $18 an hour, $22, $23 an hour, somewhere in that range. So when you break it down as an hourly thing, it's not bad in those sports, okay? I think where – I think where it becomes a challenge is probably a little bit about what you talked about in terms of travel, right? In terms of, mm -hmm. of, of what's your day job? Do you have enough time to get to a facility? Um, yeah, the your, five o'clock starts are very, very difficult. Right. Your time away from home. And now all of a sudden, even though you look at that and on its surface, that's a fair amount, okay, for the job that you're doing. But is it worth it? to you personally when it takes time away from your family, whatever. So that, 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 that's an interesting dynamic. But, but the, the funny part about it is I, I, I don't know if we said to Mar, hey, we're going to pay $100 a game instead of 70 do all of a sudden we don't have an official shortage? I, I'm not buying that. I, I don't know, again, that that's all, again, by itself because we're never going to be able to pay enough to where it is your full-time job, it's still going to be a side, you know, 
job or a side gig. Yeah. So, so my thing is a, a school is never going to be able to pay such an obscene amount to where everybody's like, oh, man, I want to do that, right? Much like coaching, you know, when we start breaking down our hourly wage, especially if you take the time that we're thinking about it or we're laying in bed staring at the ceiling saying, right. what the heck am I going to do about this? You know, probably not a ton of money. But, but the thing of it is, coaching and officiating, wouldn't you agree they're, they're very similar in the fact that most people don't do it for the money first? Right. That's just sort of a side benefit. Most people do it because they enjoy being around the game. Mm -hmm. And then – they appreciate getting a little compensation for it. Don't get me wrong, but that's not their first priority, if that makes sense. Well, it makes total sense. I, I, I love your comparison there. I, a lot of officials I talk to will tell me it gives me a chance to stay active. It, it gives me a chance to stay around the game I love. Uh, it gives me a chance to keep relationships with coaches, uh, relationships with the kids, uh, and, and so forth, stay in the local schools and so forth. And then, it, so it is a little bit of a hobby job, uh, very, very similar to coaching, very similar to what I try to do with the website here in the SVC. You know, so I, I love that. You know, Matt, one, one thing that I was trying to do some quick math here, which I won't sit here and tell you I'm definitely right, but I, I, I think I'm close. Do you, do you still have your socks on? Or <laughs> yeah, so it, it's – I'm, I'm almost unqualified to even throw this out there because, again, I've never been an official. The only officiating classes I've taken have been as professional development where, to be honest, I've taken some different types of things to – try to increase my knowledge of the rule book as, as a basketball coach, as, as a baseball coach, and, and, and so forth, um, trying to learn the game of volleyball a little bit more. The volley, volleyball is a sport that I really started to fall in love with 15, 20 years ago. And so I don't even, I don't even know that I'm qualified to say this. This would be far more for an official to comment. I just wanted to throw it out there. When, when you start talking about budgeting money, because let's not kid ourselves, you, know, you usually don't have to talk very long in high school sports before it comes back to the to the checkbook at some point right so when i when i hear you say things like um increasing the um number of officials you know like to from five to six and and what what are we looking to pay are we looking to pay you know an average this or a high level of this so if, if i understood correctly you paid 70 bucks for for a varsity basketball game so you get two hundred and ten dollars, say, right, right, on a night. Or if you know, if you had five, um, you know, people there, and you go up to six, to go up to six on a football field, you're you're going to get closer to what four hundred twenty dollars. I, I guess I started to look at the the thing I would caution them going from five to six. And again, I'm not qualified in terms of what that means, who's watching what, controlling what, game management. I'm just curious to to get your opinion on something. If you go back to when we played, right? I, I can't remember exactly when the three-man crew came into basketball, for example. So this is the first thing I thought of when you started talking about going from five to six in football. I, I look back, and I, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, we're huge baseball fans. So go back. I, I'd have to look it up to know the exact years. Off the top of my head, it was somewhere in the mid to, to – uh, or excuse me, early to mid-90s. I don't think it was the exact same time. I think it was staggered there. But you had the Marlins and the Rockies, the expansion, and baseball went to, what, 30 teams at that point. And the other thing that was happening about the time we were in grade school to, to middle school was we went from the four-man starting rotation to five. You, you remember what I'm talking about here? Kind of you right. know, big time. Well, where I'm going with this is all of a sudden, that means throughout that next 20-year period, before the day of the specialization and before they caught up with the changes and bullpen guys nowadays are lights out and it's unreal, there for the longest time, we went through about a 20-year period, and steroids obviously played a factor, but I'm telling you this did too, where you had about 32 to 40 pitchers, somewhere in there, 32 to 40, some, so depending on the math and, and, right. and so forth, of guys who in the previous generation would have been in triple A or throwing middle relief that were starting 20% of the Major League Baseball games. You follow me? Right, right. And, and my argument was the quality of starting pitching went down. Right. So my, my, I guess what I was asking was, 
you know, don't we have to be careful in terms of expanding too much? Like, let's just say for a second you went to the two-man crew in varsity basketball, which nowadays you couldn't even comprehend that hardly with the athletes. And most people tell you three-man crews can see more. Right. Than My point is this. If, if on a Friday night here in southern Ohio in the southeast district, if we have almost 40 basketball games taking place, what that means is there's 40 more officials that are now needed to do that. Those, those are 40 right. officials that 25, 30 years ago would have been doing the freshman JV game. They'd have been more likely to get, get out and get involved more in the junior high. Maybe maybe they come over to the girls' game because I know there's some people that you know won't won't work the girls' games as as much and so forth. So again, I, I don't even know if that's doable now. My my point is though, in terms of more 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 at the same budget, if you're paying two hundred and ten dollars now, all of a sudden you could pay a hundred and five dollars to a person and, and set a seven. Now, based on the comment you said before, you don't know if that would 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 matter. I don't know. I mean, if all of a sudden well, you like it's, you're making it's, it's, 35 more bucks a game, I don't, that's a, I don't know. That's an it's interesting just, dynamic. Just, yeah. One of the, 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 the whole number sense is what kind of came to my mind. Like I said, I'm not even qualified to say if officials felt like they could do them in two main crews. Now it's just when you well, start talking five to six, that's, that's the first thing that come to my mind. That's an interesting question. I would love to ask guys that, that like say basketball right now, you mentioned basketball. Uh, I've done a lot of, I'm sort of a numbers geek, okay? So so I like data and I like looking at things, but like right. I've done, I've done a little bit of research and and we'll get into this a little bit more when we do our state of the game show in basketball down the road. But like I I've looked at things like fouls, okay? For instance, in the in the in the 80s when I the game was less physical. And I, I mean, I, I understand some people are going to disagree with that, but at the high school level, I'm telling you the game is more physical today than it's ever been. Okay. And I'm not sure. going to get into all that tonight. Cause we'll talk about that more in that other show, but, but you're talking on average about 13 more fouls a game were called and about 15 more free throws were shot. Okay. You're talking 30 years ago or whatever, early eighties into the early nineties. Okay. When, when you still had a lot of two man crews. All right. So, so the argument is, okay, you had two man crews, more was getting called. So now you start to ask the question, okay, so do you benefit from the three man crew? Well, obviously we talked about physicality, right? You can make the argument that the three man crew is helping in terms of that phys that physical part of being able to run the floor, being able to cover everything. Uh, you know that that's a real concern, especially with the age going up. Like we talked about, the average age of officials I saw was, fi was fifty five years old, and the average age of starting officials was thirty seven, which I thought was interesting. Which means that people are waiting a while. Maybe their kids are playing sports, whatever. They're waiting to get into it. But I understand what you're saying from the standpoint. Okay, like okay, so if if just as much, if not more, is getting called with a two man crew, are we benefiting enough from the three man crew? Or should we ask, and I'd, I'd love to ask an official this question, would you rather work a two-man crew and make $105 a game or $100 a game, whatever it is, right. or would you rather work a three-man crew and make 70 That would be an interesting thing because the only people qualified to, to answer that question really are veteran officials, probably guys that have done right. enough varsity games especially high level games too like tournament games are you comfortable going to the going to the district level and working uh, a pressure packed high intensity game in a two man crew and making an extra thirty five dollars to do it some of those guys may say no i don't want any part of that i, I need the three man crew but, I, I guess I asked, but, you, but, but you I guess like, I'm saying feel 30... like the, that, that the, there's less whistles and different things because when you're in a two man crew, to me, it feels like I've got to get involved. I got to do my part more with, th I think with I, and that concerns I wonder, me in football yeah. there a little bit as well. Yeah. As we get into the, the state of the bas the state of the game show at basketball, I definitely want to talk, reach out again to some right. of my people that I know that are officials and ask these questions, you know, what, because that's a whole different dynamic, but I understand what you're saying that there's definitely basketball and football. We seem not to be having these shortages but like sure and i think i think some of the sports we have the shortages in i don't know how you could have less i mean you only have two in baseball right i mean uh volleyball you need no. shoot we talk about you need more i mean yeah, you, we you have really fans do. helping you we know need, what i mean we, but, need, but it, we need four and we only have two right right 
Right. So, and schools aren't going to want to pay for four and, and there's not enough to have four. I gave you the example of the line judges in the tournament game, but so, but that is an interesting dynamic. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'd love to ask an official that like physically, do you think you could handle it? Do you feel like you would see enough? Um, would the extra money be worth working that? That, that would be a great question. Maybe if an official's watching this show or, or listening to it, maybe they can respond and we will share it next week or whatever. But, uh, but no, it's an interesting thing. I think the only other thing I saw as a reason, uh, that was brought up to me was some of the officials feel like advancement is difficult. Like in other words, getting tournament games or getting high level games. We talked a little oh, bit about the, the high level, game. but the tournament game, a lot of that's supposed to go on ratings or whatnot. A lot of officials felt like uh, more of it went on the, the, I guess the, the guys that have been around a long time and it developed a reputation. They got all the games regardless of the ratings and all this. I will say this in our neck of the woods, there's no question in my mind that was happening a lot a few years ago. Now I think it's getting better. There's some people have got involved and are doing a good job now at our district level and, and even maybe the state level, I'm not sure, of uh, rewarding people who are working a lot of games during the regular season. Cause see, that's the other thing. I mean, the, the, you, there's a minimum game amount of games you got to work to get tournament games. That really needs to be increased, in my opinion, because these guys that are out there busting their hump four or five days a week and doing a good job, they should be getting tournament games, getting rewarded for that. And I think that's happening more now. But I know when I, I remember a conversation I had with a guy about five years ago, and he said, if something doesn't change, I'm getting out because I'm out here. Uh, my ratings are good at the end of the year. And, 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 you know, every time I turn around, people are saying, hey, you know, you're doing a good job. I'm getting the ratings on paper are showing that. And I'm getting uh, a sectional semifinal girls game between the eight and nine seed. And other guys are getting seven boys tournament games at the district level. You know, it's not fair. And But I think, again, I think that's improving some in our area. But let's face it, officiating is like anything else. You want to be recognized when you do a good job. And, and that sure. recognition – like for coaches, that that comes in, you win and you advance and you get to experience a championship or whatever. And in officiating, let's face it, that recognition comes from being allowed to do a state tournament game or a high-level district game. And if you're not getting that opportunity, I'm sure that gets frustrating after a while. Matt, Matt am I going too far to say – this is how I've always felt, you know, in terms of – Am I going too far to say that if if you put a cap on it, and I'd have again, I'd have to do some math, I'd have to study it with ads, I'd have to study it with coaches to know what that cap is. But but people who do a certain amount of games should automatically have an opportunity to work at the sectional, and I don't even go as far as the district semifinal level because I guess my argument is this: if we are saying that they are qualified to do these particular games that go into the seating that impact those, then we're turning around saying that they're not good enough to do. I, I understand when it gets to the regional and state level, just like the teams that advance, right? As a coach, I look at it and say, right. over, over the years, I've had 20 years of coaching. I've had, you know, a handful of teams go onto the district level. I've had a couple really, really elite teams go to the regional level and so forth. Other years, we haven't been very good and, you know, we got beat. But my, right. my point is, my point is, if if you reach a certain number, and again, I, I I would be willing to sit down and look at that. Maybe it's maybe it's 25 varsity level games. Maybe it's 30 in terms of maybe trying to encourage, get involved in both the girls and the guys. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you separate them. But my point is, if if you have worked, if you've been tr trusted by the Southeast District Schools here in Ohio, I'll just use our area for example. To, to work 25 varsity girls games and 25 varsity guy you know, on, on the guy side, and then all of a sudden you're being told you're not good enough to do a sectional game? I, I, I don't know that I buy that. So, so do, do you think there's a way we can take it and, and move the ratings more onto the district regional level in, in terms of because, – because right now that's the feedback I'm getting. I, I'm getting three, four really, really good officials that are telling me that, hey, I – I can't even hardly just, you know, get a sectional game. I see your point on that. And I think, I think there's some validity to that. I guess the thing that concerns me, because I think in sports like football, basketball, baseball, probably 
definitely football, basketball, I think probably baseball, softball. If whatever, if that number was legitimate, like a decent high, a high enough number to where you've got to really work some games. Okay. I see some validity in that because you're probably not going to survive in those sports. If you're really bad, you're not going to continue to get hired. Okay. Hey, you're going to so have you're trouble probably, say getting 25 games, aren't but you? Let's say, but let's say girls but, basketball. But, but some of those sports we talked about with shortages, you know, you have a heartbeat and a whistle, you may get hired, right? I mean, you know, you, you, some of these sports, people are so desperate. So I think you have to be careful a little bit from that standpoint. But, yeah, I think for the most part, let's face it, if you're working that many games, you're probably a quality enough official where you ought to get a sectional game or get a chance to work that. I still think the ratings, though, are crucial. And, and I, I don't what's think the, people What's the take, ratings problem? Take us through that because I know well, you have an well, interesting well, view. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to move on to the solution, Shane, I think, right now. And, and that we'll just start with that one, okay? okay? So we always try to offer solutions, right? And we, we, we try to be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. But the ratings um, – I, coaches and athletic directors need to take these more seriously, need to pay better attention to them, need to uh, need to put more thought and effort and time into these because I really believe that the rating should be used by the people choosing tournament games or whatnot. Now, there was some controversy in our area that maybe they weren't being used. I think they are being used more now, all right, but – but as I know as a coach, I take it very seriously. Like, I really look into this. I make notes after games. You know, I try to be fair to guys, um, you know, and, and, and I'll be critical of guys uh, because, because I take my job very, very seriously, and officials – uh, affect my job somewhat, okay? So I'm going to – I'm going to – take my part in this process very seriously but i'm afraid that not everybody's doing that i think some people are just jump just going through the motions okay i'll like you know as an ad you're supposed to rank 15 officials or whatever that you think should work tournament games i'll just go on here and click 15 names you know i'm i'm, I'm afraid some people may do that well, I, I, think can't a, I, I can't get i can't i'll be real honest with you goes between the ad and the well i'll be real honest with you there's a handful of ad's i can't get a return phone call or an email from okay so i have to question whether they're really giving their best effort on officiating uh, evaluations but but be, because in all honesty there's there's a lot of turnover at the AD position at some schools. There's new faces all the time. Some, in all fairness, there's schools where athletic directors are teaching six periods a day. You know, so some of these other areas, they're just not. They don't have the time to put into it. But I think I think the evaluations are crucial. Um, so I think that that's one thing we can do better at the coach and the school administrator level. Let me let me let me hit you with a couple other things from a coaching standpoint. Um, the relationship you mentioned earlier, right, between coach and official, I think a coach's responsibility is to try to strengthen that. And I'm not always great at this, obviously. You know, we, we get heat to the moment. We get passionate. I mean, anyone watches me coaches, I'm really intense, really passionate about what I do. Uh, but I think as a coach, we've, we've got to try to better those relationships. I think, there, I think there needs to be more coach official communication outside of the game. I've always said there, it'd be nice to have a summer conference of some kind where officials and coaches can get together and talk. Just talk rules, talk procedure, talk, hey, what, what do you guys see here? Because I think that open dialogue would really help. If I could look at an official and be like, hey, why did you do this? I saw a game last year where you did this. Why did you do it? And he could say to me, I saw you lose your mind last year on somebody. Why did you do that? And we could talk about it, though, in a in a calm way because you're not going to do that in the heat of the moment in the middle of the third quarter, right? I mean, right. that's not right. time and place. So I think we need more of that open dialogue between coaches and officials. I had one guy tell me that, that he requests film from coaches a lot of times so he can watch himself on film. And some coaches won't send film. That blew my mind. Like, I've never <laughs> – any request I've ever gotten from an official to share a film, I immediately share the film. I have no problem with that. To me, I respect a guy that wants to watch film and get better. I mean, as a coach, why would I not want a guy to get better? Uh, am I? Why would I not send him my film? You know, as coaches, I'm going to be real honest with you. As coaches, we think sometimes like our stuff is so good that, that it's got to be like top secret, you know, government protected 
you know, I can't, someone might see my set that I ran in the third quarter. Who cares, man? Just send your film out. Let a guy watch it and get better. I mean, can we not share to help each other? So that, that kind of blew my mind. I figured all coaches would just share it. And one, one, of, one of the officials I talked to said some people treat their film like, you know, it's stored at Fort Knox or something, man. It can't be released. But so I, I think, again, what, this was an interesting one. I had an official tell me this. One thing coaches could do to improve situation encourage players to become officials right if you have graduating mm. seniors that you know are really smart kids love the game aren't good enough to go on and play the game at the next level hey hey have you ever thought about becoming an official you know i can show you the way to do this get you to a class you know obviously as a coach i, I have enough connections to where i'll get you some junior high games right i'll get you started and see if you like it um I can honestly tell you I have never had that conversation with a, with a player, and I probably should have because I've probably had players that might make good officials. You know, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I've got a couple former players that officiate now. And um, so I thought that was interesting. Anyway, we always like to offer solutions, I guess. Before I move on to, to some of the other parties in this, coach-wise, Shane, uh, anything else come to mind on what coaches can do to, 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 to help? Well, I think the communication certainly where it's at. I know for the longest time, uh, I probably went 10, 15 year period there where in the multiple sports I coached, I, I would try to have, um, I'd always have a guest speaker at camp, for example, almost every year right. on my days, I try to have an official right. in, in turn, in, it would be more of a respectful thing and different things at, I'd always, I'd always kind of utilize them with my older kids and I, and I would kind of you know, really teach my catcher what, what's your dialogue with an umpire, what, what's body language important for pitchers and so forth. And we talk verbal, nonverbal things of respect and so forth. It was just a real powerful message and it was, it was good stuff. But, but again, it's like anything, when, when you make those connections with, with uh, officials, I feel like in the heat of the battle, now all of a sudden they see you as a good a good person over there that's just intense. You see what I'm saying? Right. It, but there, there's, there's, a, there's a mutual respect in, in terms of they respect how much I've put into the outcome that night of winning and losing and how we play. Right. And, and I respect the fact that, hey, they're trying to get better at their craft and they're, they're trying to control an entire gymnasium and they're trying to – and there's just a, there's a great connection there. And that's why I think with the, the solution part, this whole thing of, of – making it a little easier to start and then making a little bit more fair accountability to allow them to progress at the route. Now, now here's something I see, oh, Matt, in that is in terms of the coaching aspect is, is I see a lot of opportunities for the officials that um, maybe don't want to. And I just wonder from the coaching situation now, I know it used to be uh, a little different throughout the, the little leagues and so forth. And in, in our area now, we have four games happening in basketball, say, on a Sunday afternoon. In, in junior high baseball now, we have double headers being played on Sunday. So we're, we're not only asking these people to work all week. Now it's even hard for we're, – we're even – calling them and and for lack of a better term bugging them or asking them to work again on Sundays Co coaches are in a different dynamic there so I think that the demand of more games being played um, in all sports little league you know now now some of the little leagues and volleyball and so forth coaches can still you know keep kids involved and do some different things I know the club circuit is, is really a unique thing where you know when you go to a club tournament certain Volleyball teams are going to understand kids are going to have to line judge and keep score and do different things on their rotation and so forth. So I, I guess that, that to me, that to me is the demand of more and more games being played. I see a lot of people that are just fine. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to ref some little leagues, some junior high, maybe some freshman JV level and, and don't have a, a real desire to ever go up to the varsity level. And again, that's very, very important because we need those people. But man, I see a lot of junior high officials, a lot of JV officials that are really good. And I think if they'd had the opportunity to move to the varsity level in the right environment with the right crew and that type of thing, could, could be really good volleyball officials, really good baseball umpires, you know, really um, good basketball officials. So, um, that that that's the thing too is is I don't know if we're putting the motivation out there to advance these people along in in terms of you know and kind of some of the things you've said I think that's the, a lot of the solution of 
yeah, maybe it's a little money, but it might just be a little bit more of, of a motivation or some perks to, to, to push them along and make them want to do, do better in terms of, of just their performance. Well, and it used to be, I, I know I had one official tell me this, it, you know, it used to be there was this in the summer, right? The off season, right. be an opportunity for officials to go out and work camps and work scrimmages and get better at their craft. Well, you know, some of that has died down now because like we have these team camps where they're asking officials to come in and work 12 hour days <laughs> officiating games and, and you just can't pay a guy enough to make it worth his while yeah. to do that. Yeah. You know, it's ridiculous. I think we've got to get back to, you know, trying to to have some scrimmage type situations in the summer that are that are low pressure situations where officials can come in and work on their stuff. Coaches and officials can communicate sort of in hopefully like a little bit of a less of a pressure environment. I, I know somebody told me that some of the worst fan behavior, those in these off season things at camps and at youth mm -hmm. stuff, uh, really we're talking all high school here, but a lot of this fan behavior issues at the youth level, it's really bad sometimes mm -hmm. down there. I mean, people just lose their mind. And we talked youth sports a couple weeks ago and it's, it's obviously one of, one of the faults is that people get a way, way worked up at that level. But I, I think even opportunities – I wouldn't even be opposed to having summer scrimmages without fans, just players, officials, and coaches, you know, just to allow, you know, that, that communication and that camaraderie maybe to develop a little bit. But, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. We talked about one, – one group we haven't talked as much about is school administration. What can school administrations do, Shane? And this is kind of my last point because we've already talked about – at the OHSA level, at the officials level, what they're trying to do in terms of licensing and whatever. Uh, I would like the OHSA to not um, simply uh, get stuck on this whole fan behavior thing, the reason of shortages. I think I'd like to see them explore some of these other things a little bit more, okay? But other than that, I think we've hit on that. At the school administration, what can they do? One, we talked about it. I mean, obviously, if they could come up with a little more money here, you know, as the years go on, that would help. Pay always helps. But, uh, but again, that's not the, the be all end all. I think one thing we haven't talked a lot about is this, is the crowd management issue. Okay. The fan behavior. Um, it is, it is an issue. It's not the issue as some would lead you to believe, but it is an issue. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, I had a long conversation with our assigner um, who, who does a really good job of looking at you know, the big picture, I think, and all this, but he's, you know, one of the things we talked about last year was what can schools do, okay, to better this a little bit, and there's, there's some real basic things I think schools need to do um, just up front, you know, and how they treat their officials. I mean, one, we need to do a better job of having a parking place for them behind the building or somewhere sort of private with a parking spot where they can feel safe to get to their cars after the game. You know, you hear some horror stories sometimes, right? Of somebody chasing somebody out of the building, nonsense like that. So having a place for officials to park, having a place for them to dress out of the, you know, where people can't get to them. Um, I know every facility is different. It can be challenging or whatever, but, but those are some, I think non-negotiables that have to happen. Little things, you know, how do 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 we leave some water for them? Do we have uh, do we have the proper stuff at the scores table that they might need throughout the course of a game? You know, just little things the school administrations can do. And then I think obviously security. You know, whether it be the athletic administrator, the, the building principal, the, the the sheriff deputies that you hire for the game, there has to be better security in today's day and age unfortunately we live in an age of crazy we see it every day we see a lot of nonsense we have to prepare for that it's unfortunate but it's the way it is i think an interesting dynamic to this and you had mentioned this earlier with that relationship piece but i think officials too have to play a role in game management as well and this, this may not come across as real popular but i'm going to say it because i see it i think I think coaches and officials at times escalate rather than de-escalate, you know, emotion and, and issues. Like, you know, I know as coaches we get worked up, all, all of a sudden the crowd gets worked up. I get that. You know, we have to do a better job at that. Um, I've, seen, I've seen it with officials on the other side. You know, I, I know talking to a, 
talking to a veteran official one time, he told me, he said, you know, I've told officials, listen, if a fan's out of control, don't engage that fan. Go to the principal, go to the sheriff's deputy, and just walk over to him and say, hey, listen, that dude over there in the red shirt on the front row has got to go. Let them go take care of it. You know, don't turn to the guy in the red shirt, give him the old heave ho, you know, and everybody starts going crazy because what you're doing in that situation is escalating, right? You have been demonstrative in front of everybody. I know people get caught up and get, get caught up in the heat of the moment. I do it as a coach, but we've got to start cutting some of that stuff out because that's making crowd control real issue. We had a situation at a game last year where we had like seven ejections on three to three or four different occasions. Okay. It was an ugly situation. Um, again, in those situations, it, it got to a point where uh, the officials were directly engaging the fans and that becomes dangerous at that point. I know in that we had the, the last ejection was with 18 seconds left in a 20 point game where one team was just standing at half court with the ball underneath their arm, letting the clock run out. Did that ejection have to happen, right? I mean, now all of a sudden we've got a situation at the end of a game because you can't let 18 seconds run off the court. you got to toss somebody else. So I think officials play a role in that too. They have to do a better job of not escalating. Coaches have to do a better job of not escalating. That, that's where when we talk about this crowd control issue, Shane, and you coach a sport like in baseball, for instance, especially, okay, the, that those sports concern me because a lot of times you don't have the same level of security and school administrators on hand, right? At those, at those baseball softball games that you do a basketball or football game, you can, you can get some real ugly situations if you're not careful. Well, you, you, you can. And, and I've, I've really enjoyed the process of this show throughout because what I've been doing is I've been taking notes. So I'll kind of start us on our final thoughts and then yeah. certainly give you a chance to, to, to do the same. I, I'm, I'm going to go back to, to the beginning here, Matt, and kind of walk us through here, and, 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 and I'm anxious to see if, what I'm missing because I think we've been very, very thorough here. You know, it starts, it starts with recruitment. I think, I think all of us owe it to our particular sports to pay it forward. So, you know, be it club sports, be it high school sports, be it college sports, whatever it is, coaches and, and people involved in working with young people, we need to make them aware of these opportunities to stay involved. We need to make them aware of opportunities just to, to um, uh, increase their IQ. Maybe there are future coaches or there are future parents that are going to be helping in Little League, so forth. I just think it's a great way to, to educate people. There are certainly our future fans. So recruit, recruit at a younger age. Then I would say easier to get started. I, I would say financially, Matt and and, um, and and maybe in some of the uh, experience and some of the opportunities, a little bit easier to get started. And then once they're started, it's okay to hold them a little bit more accountable in terms of the stair steps. But as they're being held accountable, if they're doing the things the proper way, what I don't see enough of is rewarding them. Um, I, I've thrown out different uh, suggestions about money. Again, I, I don't even know if I'm close there. Some officials might hear that and just think, that's stupid. Well, that's fine because, again, as I said the last couple of weeks, I'm not trying to be right. I'm trying to get it right. Sure. The the, the tournament thing, something I feel really, really strong about. You know, I mean, if if I'm going to see if I'm going to see someone umpire 25 varsity baseball games throughout the year, and then you're going to tell me they're not qualified to do the sectional, that that's tough for me to understand. You know, what I mean, at some level, you know, what I'm saying it's, uh, right. you know, may, maybe maybe. Uh, Maybe not, but again, that's just an opinion I'm throwing out there. The fan thing and the security thing I think is outstanding. I don't know that we can always control culture, Matt. I don't know that we can always control those things. The number one thing I do think we can control as administrators and as coaches and as officials are adult game management relationships. And I think the stronger those relationships are year around and in professional development and just in terms of, of, of communicating and helping the, the two sides have better understanding of, of, of one another. I think that's very, very important. And I think if those things happen, then I think there, there could be a lot of things go. So I've, I've really enjoyed this process. I, I've really challenged myself. I'll, I'll be honest. This, this is one of the shows that I've kind of found myself kind of going back and forth and being very open-minded to different things. And I'm real anxious to see the feedback because the other thing I think that I didn't really get into tonight because I wanted to save it for future shows would be rules. 
and, and how yeah. state of the game. Well, when we do the state of the game, and, we're going to talk about rules. And, and for so sure. forth. I think yeah. that has a lot to do with a, a lot of times rules put leaders such as officials in, in, in unfair spots. So that that's kind of the way I've walked my outline down this show. When you look back here at those particular things, do you feel like you've cleared your notebook or, or is there something else you'd want to add? Yeah, you know, when I started this, I had three pages of notes here. I'm sitting here looking through them, and I, I, I think we covered everything. I think for me, what what it proved is I started to look into this. And this show, I'll be honest with you, Shane, this show probably took more research than most we do because a lot of what right. we do, it we've had 20 years of research, right, just in our minds of observing. Yeah. Whereas without, with us not being officials, I really wanted to reach out and talk to some guys, and I think – I think for me, I wanted to really answer the question, hey, is this whole official shortage thing a big a deal as what people make it out to be? And I think yes and no. I think it is in some sports. I think right now it is in a lot of in some sports. And I think I think that it could become a bigger issue in the other sports if we're not careful because of that those ages we talked about of of how old officials are starting and, and becoming during their careers and maybe not getting some of those younger guys to come in and take their place. So I think that question for me was interesting to answer. And then, and then as I looked into it a little further, then why, what were the reasons? And a lot of the reasons we're seeing on social media about fan behavior and all that is only one of many issues. This is a, I guess I would stress to people, listen, don't be a slave to just, Oh, I saw something on social media again. This must be true. Mm -hmm that there's more to this. It's more of a complex issue than what people are making it out to be. And, and if we're going to solve it, when we talked about solutions, right? If we're going to solve it, when you're solving a complex issue, you can't come at it from one angle. You've got to solve it in various ways. And I think we talked about that tonight. Uh, almost every uh, official that I talked to that I really, you know, trust their opinion, their veteran guys said, recruitment is a major thing we have to start promoting officiating at a younger age at the high school level as guys are getting out and that's an area i you know be honest with you i haven't thought a lot about so i learned a little bit from that i think there's several things we talked about in terms of hopefully solving these problems going forward and uh you know hey it was fun like like it usually is and uh hopefully we get some feedback because i would love to hear from anybody, but I would love to hear from officials, especially if, if they had an opinion on this. Um, so, but anyway, um, yeah, I, th I think we covered it and I enjoyed the show. Fans, let us know what you think. Um, uh, you can do it on all, all the social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're out there, sbcsportzone.com. Email admin1 at sbcsportzone.com or, or just simply leave us a comment there on um, the YouTube channel. SBC Sport Zone Shane. Uh, again, the, the feedback has just been tremendous uh, for, for, for several weeks now, and, and uh, it, it's hard to believe we're 10 shows in, but we're having a lot of fun. We're going to keep it going. We, we have we have four or five topics still somewhere in the next two to three months. We know it's going to fill in there somewhere, but we're going to kind of wait to see what the real world of sports has in, in store for us as it gets back and, and, and running. And then, obviously, the feedback each and every week continues to generate. So, Matt, on that note, uh, we'll get on out of here. Appreciate everybody uh, continuing to uh, listen to Expanding the Zone. Thanks, everybody.